in uh, law school, and uh, you'll uh, have that JD rather soon, I understand. Yes, sir. Fin uh, finish in December, so got okay, one he, semester left. He has been a county commissioner, and he has been the chairman of his county commission. What county? Clay County. Yep, I, I grew up in the area, and then um, when I moved down here for law school, but I've been coming to Lake County for 10, 15 years, um, and ha it was sort of my second home for many years, and now it's officially my home, which is, is nice. And I hope my, my goal is to be involved in education and, and serve on the board and make a difference there, because my heart is still um, very much in education and in practice law. And so, um, yeah. So, Gavin, we, we have until 1 o'clock... You can take as much time as you would like to explain yourself. Know that Vance is filming everything, Perfect. and he is diligent about putting it out on Rumble. Great. So you're reaching a lot more people yeah. than are in the room. Absolutely. Love that. And I think that's good. I think we should know where our public officials are on issues and, and hold them accountable. And um, thank you guys for being here. I know I've met and talked to, to many of you, but excited to get in depth because at the REC meeting on Tuesday and various other settings, I try to keep things as brief as possible because we have time limits and I know we don't want to go on and on, but I'm in this setting I can get into more detail and I love detail. I love the nuance of, of um, what we can do and how we can make the, the school district great. I think we're doing a lot of good things in um, Lake County schools, but I really want to take it to the next level. And one of the things, um, there's if, if you haven't got my brochure, I'll kind of start out. Um, you did a great job on my bio, so I don't. I won't go into much on that. If you have questions, feel free to ask. But one of the things I think this quote on here is is important because a lot of people ask about this. I'll be a voice for all families, and I think oftentimes when someone runs for school board and people think of the school board races, they often think of them as the person who's going to be in charge of public schools only. And although public schools are a big part of what we do, they're not all of what we do, and we have to be a voice for all families. And education is changing um, with charter schools, private schools, Christian schools, um, homeschool. And there's lots of different um, options for parents, and I think that's a good thing. I think that gives parents an opportunity to find what's best for their students. And so I'll be a voice for all of that. Um, and one of the things I talked about this morning with a gentleman was with the charter schools, he said, um, are you anti-charter? I said, absolutely not. I'm, I'm in favor of um, supporting all the different options that we have for our, our families. And so I think that's important because um, oftentimes when school boards kind of get fixated on just the public school. So I think I wanted to start with that and then um, I guess we'll go to questions. So if you okay. want me to, any, if we don't have questions, I, I oh, can talk we, all day. We but. have, we <laughs> have questions. Perfect, let's we do it. We have questions. First of all, what is the difference between you and your opponent? So I think that uh, my opponent's a nice person. I've actually never met my opponent, but um, from everything I've, I've heard, she's a nice person. Um, she served as a um, principal and a teacher, and I think that's very admirable, and I have respect for that. Um, the, I think the big difference is bold um, willingness to courageous leadership, and that's what I'll bring. I won't be afraid to speak out on the issues. I won't. Um, be afraid to, to be a voice, a conservative voice on the board. I think that's one thing. And I think also who's supporting us. Um, if you look at the uh, campaign reports for my opponent in 2020, the Democratic Party of Lake County gave her $750 and then both unions. And I think there are a lot of great people, in teachers in unions, but I don't know, I don't align with the values of the teachers union, um, especially on a lot of the woke liberal stuff that they're pushing. Um, I am in favor of teacher raises, and the governor, Governor DeSantis, has led on that issue, and there's $1.2 billion in next year's budget coming um, for teacher raises specifically from state sales tax money and other sources. And so I think at the, the local level, we can take that and give our teachers a hard-earned raise. And so I s certainly support teachers, but I think one of the big differences is where we're aligned in terms of um, teachers' unions and then in terms of um, I would never accept money from the Democratic Party of Lake County. Um, and I'm, I'm um, unapologetically, if you look, if you Google me, I've been fighting for conservative values um, my entire life. And so I think that's a big difference. But I think she's a nice person and certainly don't she, have anything what's to. Her name? Uh, Molly Cunningham. Yeah, I, I try not to say my opponent's name because I don't want to give her any extra name recognition. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. A uh, point of information. Just, sure, yeah. To clarify is that. 
Molly, when she first ran, she was in this room at this type of event. I've got the videos up on uh, my YouTube channel, and uh, she claimed she was a Republican. And uh, just, you know, so it's kind of like disappointing to find that she's flipped, because uh, I know her fairly well. Um, and one difference, too, is I'm endorsed by the Republican Party of Lake County, um, and that was um, a transparent process, and everyone got to share their piece and both sides of it. And, and that's what's amazing about I love our country, because we can debate and discuss and agree and disagree and still be friends. And that's, that's what I love about our country. And that process happened, and, and the Republican Party and its supermajority voted to endorse me. So. Um, do you think homeschool students are entitled to the public school system's support? Absolutely. How does that support look? Absolutely, 100%. And um, that's why Josh, so Josh Blake is a homeschool family. Uh, he's a commissioner, obviously you know him as a commissioner. But he endorsed me, and um, in his quote, he talks about knowing that I'll be a voice for homeschool families. I was actually homeschooled till ninth grade. And then ninth through 12th grade, I went to public school and um, enjoyed both experiences. I think both of them had their value. Um, but homeschool families, how specifically can we do that? I think it's access to library resources. And um, sometimes I know that's scary if the craziness is in some of the libraries. So we have to make sure that we have um, good accountability on what resources are available in, in those school libraries specifically. But um, playing sports, Tim Tebow, I'm a fan, I'm a Gator, so don't hold that against me if you're not a Gator fan. But Tim Tebow was homeschool and also played football for Nice High School. So I think sports is another way. And then just generally working with family, homeschool families as opposed to treating them like they're second class citizens or, oh, you're not in the public school, so you're one of them. We have to let them know that we are there to support all families, regardless of their education choice. And they're taxpayers who are contributing to the pot of education to help all students. And if you look at test scores and various other things, homeschool families are doing a great job for the most part. Obviously, each family is different, but for the most part, doing a great job of um, educating their, their own children. And I think that's what makes our country great, that choice. So um, I can get into more specifics, but I'd also love more feedback on how we can support homeschool families. Mike. So. so if I can elaborate on yeah. that. So, so we want the money to follow the child. Absolutely. So you're saying the money should follow the child into the homeschool For sure. environment and, as and, well. And um, the current voucher system at the state level is set up where um, the homeschool families can get money for education resources, so curriculum and that type of thing. They can apply through Step Up for Children, I believe it is, the website, and then they can get resources. So for sure that at the state level in terms of the funding following the child, but also at the local level in terms of there's an apparatus, a school system that's set up for primarily public school students, but I think homeschool students should have access to those same resources and support um, in, in various capacities. And one of the things I like to do is a citizen think tank and bring homeschool families onto that and have maybe four or five, um, however many we need, and get give um, have them come up with a list of recommendations on how the school system, Lake County School District, can better support um, homeschool families and what they're doing. So. Well, the yeah, okay. advice. Yeah. Um, I get the idea that we just kind of turn them loose. You want to be a homeschool parent? You sign here, go do it. I, I think that's uh, not a good idea. As a 39 year mm -hmm. school system person, and administrator, most of it. There's a lot of direction we can give them, even though if, even if it's workshops about where to find resources on the computer, or Great what kind idea. of books to have, uh, where to find tutors. That kind of thing just should be mandatory to, to help these people. You know, Absolutely. At low cost. Yeah, no, that's a great. Um, and also, I think a big thing that is not as known in, when it comes to um, the home, uh, like, and that goes to your point, almost like an orientation um, where they can find out what resources, a lot of virtual resources. So if you're a homeschool family, you might want to teach your kids certain aspects of the curriculum, but you may want them to take, let's say, a Mandarin Chinese class, and you might not know Mandarin or how to teach that. There, Florida Virtual and other virtual um, opportunities are out there that offer those courses, and that, that they might not know about those um, opportunities, and so that's a great point. You could do like a homeschool orientation where they are, we point them in the right direction and, and then also continue to main con maintain contact. So, Okay. 
This is my question. And I asked this very same question of uh, Tyler Brandberg uh, two weeks ago. Perfect. Education in the information age. Education is changing before our eyes and at a pace that is just unmanageable, I think. With Absolutely. two taps of the screen, more information can be in front of a student's eyes than you can possibly pass on in a week in the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. My concerns are threefold. One, how do you help the student determine the veracity of what they're seeing on yeah. here? Two, how do you prevent the overload of information that they're getting here from diminishing the importance of what they're hearing in the classroom? And three, how do you address, identify and address what I consider absolute psychological addiction to this yeah. device? Yeah. Well, so I'll start with the, the last question and work backwards, if that's okay. Um, so the psychological addiction piece, um, it's definitely, there's scientific studies out there, peer-reviewed, that say that it is highly addictive and it's created to be highly addictive from the color screen, screens and the way everything is set up. Um, and so I think one way to do that is discipline of use of phones at schools. And so the, the state has now passed, um, but at the local level we have to implement um, the no phones in class policy. And that's obviously there's exceptions if you're using the phone for instructional purposes. But I think we have to be care be um, maintain that with fidelity and, and make sure that the no phones policy happens. Because students just simply cannot, even if they're really enjoying the topic, they can't help themselves. I, mm -hmm. I find this myself, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I'm in, in class at in the law school sometimes, the phone just wants to, it screams, hey, look at me and talk to me. You know, but I got a text, and it might not even be an important text, but it's, it's very addicting, so you got to uh, maintain that discipline in teaching them to do that. I think education isn't just, and Ken, obviously we agree with this, I think, probably, but it's not just about passing on knowledge. It's about creating citizens and creating people who are going to be in our society, and part of that is teaching them proper phone use. Um, so, and then in terms of the veracity piece and there's so much information, I think there's a misconception that because they have access to so much information, they don't need to be learning information in schools. They need to just learn how to access information. And that's partly true, but we do know, especially with reading, that you have to have content knowledge, background knowledge to interpret reading. First of all, I'm in favor of phonics instruction for reading at, um, starting out. I think that's important. And I've, um, my understanding is that we have a very solid phonics-based reading curriculum in Lake County, and so I would continue to support that. But when you're reading a newspaper and it says, for instance, um, out of Tallahassee, we expect changes to come when it, the policy changes to come. If you do not know the capital of the state of Florida, even if you could Google it, but imagine this, like think, think about this. I'm a student, I have never been taught the states and capitals. So then I'm trying to read on my newspaper about Tallahassee and I'm trying to interpret it and so I'm like Tallahassee and I Google it okay that's the state capital the reality is you need background knowledge that that's the state capital that's the seat of government and as a result of that it's being used as a proxy to explain that out of the seat of government in Florida information is or policies changes are coming you might know how to read words but if you don't have background knowledge you cannot interpret and, and decode what that newspaper is saying and so even though we are in an information age where there's tons of information at our fingertips, the Library of Alexandria and Library of Congress and every other resource are available at our fingertips, we still need students to know basic information and knowledge. And so that's why I'm a big supporter of um, knowledge-based curriculum, not just skills, because there's a, skills are important, critical thinking is important, but critical thinking can't be taught in a vacuum. It has to be taught based on knowledge and foundation. So founding documents, um, and I'm a big fan of memorization. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's the First Amendment, right? When people say, well, the First Amendment this, the First Amendment that, does it help knowing that I have it memorized? Yeah, it does. I have that background knowledge. Um, when people say, well, separation of church and state, I can say, well, that's actually not in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. In fact, it says we're, all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. 
but I think you're referring to a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist um, uh, in, in Connecticut where they were wanting to make sure no official denomination could be established a, across our country. But in no way was Jefferson suggesting that a, a student can't bring their Bible to school or can't have a religion influence their decision making. So knowledge helps. Knowledge is important. And if I had to Google all that, it just at some point cognitive behavioral psychologists and, and scientists have said this, that students have essentially a blank slate when they come in and we have the opportunity to infuse into them American culture, American history and knowledge of that, and how to be a citizen, along with science and math and all those other subjects that are very important. But a key component that I think is being lost is that citizenship piece. So teaching them foundational documents helps them see the, the lie. Um, they learn, if you learn the truth, but I also think, in a very practical way to your question, what we can do is we can t do a class, a little segment on how to spot errors online, how to see the difference between is the Babylon Bee a real news article or is it satire? It's satire and it's hilarious and I love it, but it's not a real news article. And a lot, I've, I've, I've had people who are very smart people who share a satirical article and think it's real and are outraged by it and I text them, I'm like, you understand it's a satire? And, oh, I didn't know that was it. <laughs> so we have this even adults do it. it so I think doing that and, and taking th students through a very practical process of, of identifying the lies and being truth seekers and thinking critically about information would be also a good thing um, to incorporate, especially in it could be in history class related to elections. It could also be in science related to the scientific method and peer-reviewed research. So if someone posting something on Facebook doesn't automatically make it true. Let's look at was there a peer research study done? Was it based on double-blind studies? The, the, that process of rigor um, should be brought in. So all those ways, I think, help us fight back. But it's certainly a struggle. I mean, there's always going to be misinformation and crazy information out there. but. We have to, on some level, there has to be that freedom of speech to allow people even to have wrong ideas. Um, so, probably a long answer, sorry. No, that's I'll try right. to no, that, I actually learned okay, something good. off of that, so thank Here's you. Here's my <laughs> second question, and it has to do with standards in education. Every dollar, and it takes millions of dollars to educate yeah. tens of thousands of students, every dollar has a standard attached to it, a set of standards, minimum mm -hmm. standards, and I consider that a problem because minimum standards, rightly so, have to properly serve those at the lower end of the intellectual scale. My concern is with the people at the higher end of yeah. the intellectual scale. What programs would you suggest to stimulate them so that they don't get bored with simple schoolwork and look for stimulation elsewhere? Uh, great question. I think you, the heart of it, you're saying differentiated instruction um, is, is how do we do that, right? And um, I think, so it depends on what grade level. In the lower grades, I think that there is a value to having smart students and students who are a little weaker interacting because then they help bring the whole class up. But I do think you need to continue to, to feed that student who's way ahead and make sure that they, and so you can give them additional resources to read. And um, that's where training, training the teacher, um, teacher training is a key part of that and facilitating that. So um, when, when it comes to the higher grades, that's where you get into the honors, AP, advanced, and they, they have a chance to self-select essentially into classes that are more advanced. Um, in terms of our standards in general, that's a great question. We have actually lowered our standards in many ways. And what's interesting is if you look at grade point averages graduating, they have consistently gone up throughout the years. But if you look at our PISA scores, which is an international um, test that students take and we see how we rank in the world, we have consistently dropped on that. And the PISA scores have stayed the same in terms of the, the methodology for ask, um, testing students. Whereas places like Singapore and South Korea and other Asian nations have, have moved up. And that's because a part of it is because they kept with, um, they didn't adopt progressive education ideas of student-centered education, which sounds nice, right? It should be about the students. 
but they, um, unfortunately, this concept of child development that um, Pinochet and others, uh, French guy, I think, I, it may not be, P, it starts with a P, the French developmental psychologist came up with, aren't, have been debunked largely in the way students develop. And the reality is students should be given um, quality content and rigor. It shouldn't be this aimless, the blind leading the blind. And so that there's this term in, in progressive education that, we need to take the teacher off the stage, make the teacher the guide by the student's side. It sounds nice, and in some cases that is important and helpful. But I think, especially in the elementary grades, we need to return the sage to the stage because the sage knows more than the student. And so, like, I had a class, where, and my professor had a progressive ideology of how to teach, and it was my First Amendment class. I knew, actually knew quite a bit about the First Amendment already before the class, but the professor had us discuss things all the time amongst ourselves and us do presentations and all this and it sounds kind of good on some level the reality is we did not know the First Amendment yet he did and so it was a, a horrific it was a coordination issue it we ended up learning very little and everyone was frustrated but he had this idea of him being in the back of the classroom and letting the students do everything now I think student engagement is very important student engagement is key but at some point we need teacher-led instruction knowledge-based teacher-led instruction. I'm very passionate about that because what, and what's that difference? The difference is, instead of me saying, Johnny, what are your thoughts on the pyramids of Egypt? You gotta teach him something first about the pyramids of Egypt. He, he isn't gonna have a thought on Pharaoh yet. Um, you have to teach him that high, the high quality knowledge content first. So I want to return the teachers as the sage to the stage, allow them to have the tools to discipline students not so punitive that it affects the rest of their lives unless it's a violent crime, but accountability. So small disciplinary actions that keep them in check and get them on the right direction. Kind of like my parents would always say, this is hurting me more than you before they'd spank me, right? You know, <laughs> that, that loving, gentle correction. Um, and I got a lot of spankings grow up. Before, <laughs> so that, that's, um, I could go on for a while on that. There's a great book um, called How to Educate a Citizen by Edie Hirsch, um, who is a big proponent of the importance of teaching knowledge in our schools. Um, I don't agree with everything he says, but I agree with the co fundamental concept that schools should teach and create citizens and educate citizens and we've lost that what we've done is we've said well all school cultures are the same and everything's great and all let's just and we we end up have lost what it means to be an american we're not passing that down mm -hmm. so if we pass down those founding documents and florida has done a great job we there is a lot of hope Hillsdale, are you guys Thank anyone you familiar with Hillsdale yes. College? Yes. Yes. Love love Hillsdale has actually cool. been involved in the curriculum um, and standards for social studies in Florida um, more recently under um, our great governor, uh, Ron DeSantis, and Commissioner um, of Education, Manny Diaz. And I actually spoke to him the other day and, and complimented him on some of the things they're doing and said, we want to work closely with you on especially the civics piece. Um, and, and citizenship piece. So there are a lot of good things happening in terms of returning the founding documents. When I was teaching civics, um, we uh, had, hey Ralph, how are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, we'll, get to the, we'll get to the how to save money on tires portion. In a well, hey, now you're talking about procurement systems. Yes. So you know, you yeah, and I know, and Vance is very sharp on all that too, obviously, the how to save money RFP process and that kind of thing. But I'll wrap that up because I get long-winded. Sorry, it's a teacher in me. But the reality is that we have to teach knowledge even in an age where knowledge is at your fingertips because then we get to, to decide what that knowledge is. And um, that's important. I think that's fine. And how many times have you heard that Governor DeSantis wanted transparency in education, so he's a book burner or he's in favor of burning oh, books? Geez. No, he's in favor of curriculum uh -huh. choices. That we can't teach everything to everyone about everything, and like we're, if 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 your teacher is in the classroom saying communism is the greatest thing ever, I do, I'm not saying it is. I'm saying that would be a horrific thing. Yeah. Communism is the greatest thing ever, and we need to support communism wholeheartedly. Mm. That is not something that should be taught in our classrooms. One, it's wrong. It's just yeah. completely untruthful. But two, curriculum choices mean we get to choose, and we should perpetuate our great country. 
we should perpetuate citizenship in what we're teaching our students. And that means we talk about the faults of our country, but not the faults only. And we right. put that in context. And I think that's one of the things. Um, the Civic Seal of Excellence is a really cool program where uh, social studies teachers can go through this training. It's, I think, about 50 hours. And then afterwards, the state has a pot of money set aside, and they give them a $3,000 bonus for wow. going through the program. Mm -hmm. It nice. ran out of funding, and so there's now a waiting list. But I just actually talked to the superintendent about this and let her know that they're opening up um, a new, and I think she was already tracking this, but opening up a new um, tranche of that money July 1st, and we should have every Lake County teacher going through That's that if awesome. possible. Um, and yeah. that focuses on foundations of our country. And important things like we're a republic, not purely just a democracy, and those types of important things, founding documents. So when we train our teachers and those teachers train our students, they know the truth and they'll spot, be able to spot the lie. So very long answer, but good question. Yeah, that's good. Okay. It's almost the same concept as they want parents to be friends to their children, yeah. not be the leaders in yeah. teaching their children. It's the, it's the same basic concept. For sure. Yeah. And I think a lot, in, it's not one or the other only. I think there is some guide by the side that's necessary at times, and some small group instruction can be helpful. Um, but I think it's important to remember these students are empty slates on some level. They do not know the knowledge yet. The teacher does, and that needs to be passed on. It needs to be trained. And we know that's how psychology works in terms of the, the brain and the cognitive um, yeah. process. Okay, staying on curriculums, how would you modify class curriculums so students learn AI and can train for jobs that will not be replaced by AI? Okay, um, so the, one, the good thing is that a lot of the trade and technical stuff, like AI is never going to be able to fix your air conditioning, right? Um, AI is never going to be able to build a building. Um, and so there's some of those trades, I think one of the goals of Lake County is to increase our industry certifications. That's a fancy way of saying a student graduates with a skill and a certification that says they know how to do that skill. And so that they can immediately go and, and work. And what's, what's your lowest paid person make, Ralph? Probably, probably 20 bucks an hour at least, 15, 15. So they can immediately, you probably are always looking for good people who are willing to work hard and understand automotive industry, right? Yeah. So if they have that certification, they can immediately go and work for any number of, um, and there's always a need for that. There's always a lack of that labor. Um, as far as how to teach it on, on AI, there's a thing called Code.org and some other business organizations that have partnered with teaching coding early on, because coding, I don't know how to code. Not coding, um, AI is different than coding. Well, I, I, yeah. I hear you, but I'm, I'm saying that um, that's a, found, a start to the process of, of understanding computers. Um, and so, the um, and they've branched out now into AI, but a lot of it has to do with mathematics and teaching math the right way. And, um, and a lot of that has to do with teaching the teachers the right way to teach math. Because a lot of, of our elementary school teachers are phenomenal people, but they struggle with math and how to teach it the right way and the concepts of how to break it down. And so by the time you get to sixth and seventh grade, you have students who are already behind and don't understand the basics of math, and so they struggle in algebra and it becomes a process. And so if you start back here in the elementary grades, and a lot of it is also specializing, and so a lot of schools do this, but I, I'm a, I think it, it's helpful to have where Half the day the students are with the social studies and English language arts um, writing teacher, and then half the day they shift over to a teacher who's stronger in mathematics, and then they can specialize in that. And that's what obviously a lot of our medical field does is specialize, and so they're better at that particular illness. And so um, math, I think, learn get our teachers learning to teach math correctly, and our students learning mathematics correctly, and then some of the coding is key to them knowing how to do the AI stuff. As far as jobs that aren't related to AI, I think that's an industry certifications thing. Hard work, basics, um, human interaction skills, and, and that work ethic, that, that part of that comes in the citizenship piece too. You know, um, to quote a, a Democrat who probably would have been a Republican now, John F. Kennedy obviously said, mm -hmm. ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Citizenship's a two-way street. It's not just what the country can do for me. It's right. how can you give back. And um, that work ethic, I think, spills over into jobs that aren't going to go away. So. 
Okay, let's that. move on can, to Can some I expand excellent. on that? Okay, I think you need to learn about AI. Um, the, uh, the issue is that they need to stop this pushing everybody to go get a degree that then, I mean, there's massive layoffs going on, even in the tech industry, yeah. Yeah. because they're all being replaced, even uh, a lot of the actors that you see on on movies uh, and TV shows, they're going to start replacing those with computer AI generated actors. And uh, pretty soon you're going to be down to that's all you're going to see. Yeah. And it's really a thing. It's going on and I, I personally believe that, that the school board is naive about understanding how fast this is coming down the line. And it really, they, they like need a, a tiger team to research and get people that are competent and understand AI, not just put some people on their English teachers. Yeah. Because they just will not be able to cope with that. Sounds and, like, are you volunteering to head up our AI research <laughs> and think tank? I just resigned the internal audit, audit yeah. chairmanship. Well, perfect. Sounds uh, like you need but, another position. Uh, I, I might, uh, might actually talk to Cornegie about that. I kind of hate that. I think we should, yeah. But they, they really need a tiger team in it because my belief is that uh, probably 50% or more of their curriculum is outmoded. You know, why should you have to spend two semesters learning algebra when you can ask as you have a need, you can do the research, and there's videos out there that will teach you. Yeah. And they're better than the doctors we've got. They're better than the lawyers that we've got. Um, and so, and diplomats, too. So, I do um, think technology can assist with the, the learning for sure. I, what will happen is when somebody in this state gets approached by some big company and they say, we want to get a contract to replace school districts with a full AI teaching box, and mm -hmm. here it is. And that's what you're going to be confronting in the next few years. Yeah, there's there's a lot of challenges, in the, but I think that the skill sets, teaching the skill sets um, and the technical education can be a key, key component to marketability and making sure that students have skill sets. And I agree on the college thing that um, college can be great for some, but especially the state of modern colleges where it's um, you know, woke indoctrination degree that costs you two hundred thousand dollars that Biden claims so white for free, but it's really just shifting the burden to all of us as taxpayers. Um, there, again, you, you the the trades are, are super valuable, and why I'm so passionate about citizenship is because whether you go on to get a PhD and get the most education anyone's ever had, or whether you graduate and go right into working hard as a AC. Um, technician or um, mechanic or electrician, you're an American electrician, you're an American PhD. Either way, that citizenship piece is so critical. And so if we graduate students with skill sets, but not a knowledge of our country, we're going to lose our country. Because the reality is internationally, lots of people can do certain skills, but they're not Americans. Um, and that to keep our country the great republic it is, we have to train that citizenship. And pass that on. The one thing I think we are eliminating AI is eliminating, I had a stroke, so I'm stuttering, sorry, eliminating um, social interaction. For sure. Yeah. So Absolutely. That's, that's um, a challenge. Yeah, that's a challenge, and that's something yeah, that should be a subject teachers. social interaction, you know? For sure. Yeah, the and that's where I think the. Um, that, that's part of the citizenship piece, is the interacting, how to imp interact with people you may disagree with. And me and Mike can teach that class, right? <laughs> um, and how to, how to debate and how to um, have back and forth and, and resiliency. And, but yeah, that's, that's all a very important part of, of what schools do. And, and teaching the manners, basic manners, it should, yeah. it should be done at home. Yeah. Unfortunately, it often isn't. But, that's one of the reasons, like um, I put on my literature, and I don't think our schools are are a, chick, are a chicken sandwich place, but Chick Fil A style leadership, because Chick Fil A takes students from a lot of different backgrounds, and they turn them into students who, or, or, uh, or workers who, when you come by, they're they are pleasant. They say my pleasure. Yep. They're on it. They're smiling. 
and they're oftentimes standing out in their hot sun. I've often thought, like, Phew, that's brutal. Like, uh, and I, I'm a fairly frequent visitor of Chick Fil A, but um, they have a culture and a training program that that has that social interaction. that social interaction, that standard of excellence that I think we can infuse. Uh, both in, into our HR and also into our schools. And they support their students financially because Absolutely. I know scholarships, yeah. my um, granddaughter works at Chick-fil-A, or oh, she nice. did at Illinois. They gave her a $2,500 scholarship. That's now awesome. she moved to Tennessee, she's going back to Chick-fil-A. They'll continue to give her those scholarships throughout college. Wow. That's awesome. So That's they, awesome. they support them as well. Exactly. Financial. Yeah, they, they're a great company. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Okay, let's move on to the car. All right. Because I got a lot. Of I thought cards. we had had already some cards. Well, I very much like that. Bring the sage to the stage. Love yeah, that. I love that. So, how will yeah. you ensure that we have qualified, motivated teachers and support principals who are willing and and support yeah. principals? Support and are staff, you willing, probably. Yeah, like support and, and staff. And are you willing to release those who aren't qualified? If and support motivated. principals who are willing to release. To say it sounds like a Ken question. Yeah. If maybe you're not supposed to call call people out, but I like it. <laughs> um, and um, so one on the, I'll start with the the releasing. The, the, we absolutely should fire bad teachers. Some pe there are people who get into education, most of them, have great motives or sweet, amazing, wonderful people who dedicate their lives to doing something that they're not going to make a ton of money doing, but they know it's important. And that's the majority of teachers, but there are some bad apples in there, and we got to get those out because they hurt the rest of the teachers and the students, most importantly. And how do you um, do that with tenure? Well, here's what... So, Florida has two systems, two tiers right now. We have what's called the annual contract system, and um, the majority of our teachers, I believe, are on the annual contract system. And each year, at the end of the year, um, there, there, there's a review done. I was an annual contract teacher, and if I didn't perform, and they felt like I wasn't doing the best, then I could be let go. It's not technically fired, but I could not be renewed. Um, and but I had my students had a 98% pass rate on the end of course exam that the state has a 70% pass rate on. So obviously we were you know I was doing um, doing well in terms of the the test scores and that type of thing. But some teachers are still on the professional services contract, but there still is a way to, to um, if a teacher isn't performing to do that paperwork. But here's we're really not in a situation where we have too many teachers and we need to get rid of some of them. What we're in a situation where we, we need, we're desperate for to, to get people, good high quality people. And so the recruitment piece is really an important part of it, but absolutely I support. And, and what that looks like is when a principal makes a decision, hey, this person needs to go, they need to go. It doesn't need to be they shift to a different principal because Ken probably knows how this happens oftentimes where it's like, hey, I'll give you this person, they're not great and then you take them and then I'll do, that and I'll do a favor for you down the line. No, that person just needs to find a different role. There's plenty of, of roles out there for different people and different fits. Um, I did a call center in college for about a week and I realized when I had to clock out to go to the bathroom and various other things, yeah. that was not my role yeah. that I was best at and I wanted to do. So every job isn't for everyone. And But then that, what we can do is focus our resources and efforts on those who are doing awesome. Um, so on the on the uh, recruitment piece, we got to raise raise salaries, um, and we're not even really necessarily meeting inflation because inflation is killing everyone. But especially our teachers, you, you can barely get in a house, so a lot of them are having to just rent um, bare bones that type of thing. So um, thankfully, the, with the governor's budget of the 1.2 billion, we can give raises without raising taxes. Um, the other thing is, I would love to see um, Sumter Lake Sumter State College have a teacher training program. I know that's a big ask and it's not just one school board member making that happen in the state board of education it requires law changes and all that. But I think if we had a teacher training or teacher college at least at the bachelor's level in in Lake County then we could feed those teachers right into the schools in, in a meaningful way. So that's another way. Um, and then another thing and, and again this isn't fully fleshed out I'll just be honest with you about that but um, on the recognition, well, on the recognition piece, I, we, I think a military-style awards program. So the military, people will do feats of heroism and 
other things for a little ribbon that says, you know, you were, and I think we do good with Teacher of the Year and other programs recognize teachers, but I think we could do that in a more systematic way throughout the year um, for, for, you know, you were the uh, teacher who was best team member or, or different types of awards to recognize teachers throughout the year. They get switched around from teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher. I'm just telling you what happened. The teacher of the year? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then that way, that's another way to recognize the great work they're doing. And then... No, it's right. I'm saying... I know what you're saying about teacher of the year. This group, not yes. this one, this one, this yeah. one, this one. All right, so. Well, what I'm saying is that, that with the recognition program, teacher of the year, I'm saying, is already happening, right? Yeah, right. And he says it's a musical chairs and yeah. it's let's this person got it last year, let's give it to this person yeah. this year. But it's a one-time thing at the end of the year. What I'm saying we need to do is throughout the year have a systematic awards program um, where similar to like in the military, it's, some of them are longevity, like if you serve for five years, you get a ribbon for that. Mm -hmm. Some of it is if you do something outstanding above and beyond the call of duty. Obviously the highest level is the Medal of Honor and that's typically if under fire and um, uh, gallantry beyond the, the call. But specifically in the, um, and so I think that's another way. And then the, if we had a teacher college, the student, or we could, as soon as a teacher graduates, in many cases, hopefully we could retain them here in uh, Lake County. I think we have, um, we do work with UCF and other schools, and I think we need to continue to expand those programs. The people who get those awards is Mary Sue, who put on the coffee last weekend for the faculty, or it's the one who she came to more football than anybody else. It's, and it should be classroom related. Mm -hmm. There's what we need the award uh, presented, and not yeah. because you. Uh, I, I brought you out of class five times and gave you somebody to cover your class and you came over here and helped in a committee. And that's Instructional um, progress related, yeah, for sure. And Florida has a, a structure now, it's called the VAM, um, the Value Added Model, where it's, um, it's part of a teacher's salary is, re is connected and related to how their students do. And it, it's, um, I think, has some benefits and some challenges. but. Um, that that is a component to in terms of the salary piece, mm -hmm. but another thing is giving them opportunities like the Civic Seal of Excellence. Like if you're a teacher and you get a thir three thousand dollar additional bonus, you had to go to additional training for sure. But that's an incentive to stay in it because you're getting an extra three thousand. So um, those are a couple of the ways. I, I I would love to hear additional thoughts on how we can continue to boost morale. Oh, discipline is another one. We already talked about that, but I think. We've got to support our teachers in the discipline piece and not be afraid of a parent coming in and saying, why did you discipline my child? Yes. They're perfect. Well, they weren't perfect today, and mm -hmm. we're working with them to get there, but they, they need accountability. And what is more, no, there's nothing more discouraging than a to a teacher than a chaotic class that they feel they have no control over, and their administrator isn't going to support them because they're afraid of a parent, and the parent, we've got to be willing to stand the ground and support our teachers in making sure that they're disciplining within reason obviously our, our students so Ralph yeah let me ask you a follow-up question the um, my daughter-in-law is a substitute teacher at some of the schools most people don't want to go to and uh -huh. stipend because they go to those schools and uh, where do you draw the line um, you know I know if uh, the teacher walked up to and said hey everybody open their books to page 182 and we're going to conjugate some effing verbs today you know, that would be uh, not appropriate. Right. That teacher would probably get uh, yeah. reprimanded, not let go, whatever. Yeah. Uh, why do teachers have to tolerate that out of the children? I know we have these alternative mm -hmm. schools. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we get that a lot, and uh, even some teachers are intimidated or threatened. And, you know, I'm sure they embellish it a little bit. But the fact of the matter, I think in some schools it's real. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? Where do we draw the line? I'll give you an example. When you were probably in elementary school, my son, uh, just Bonnie McKee, Bob McKee's wife, was his teacher. He just wouldn't participate in class. She called me up one day. I went down there. I said, oh, no security. Just walked up. Come here. He's 16 years old and big as you are. I said, if I see you, do, if I get a call from Miss McKee again, you know, I'll have you out here and I'll pull your pants down. I'll whip your ass so everybody can see out the window. He went back in. No more problem. Yeah. Like, that's how we dealt with it, you know, 20, 25 years ago. I'm not saying we go back there. That's probably what Ken would like. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think you got to be more than let, you can't let, kids talk that, I mean, and just, well, he's having problems at home. Yeah. Bullshit. It's good back range, line. but bottom line is... The goal of the principal or the administrator of the Dayton County School System was, no matter how bad the kid was, 
and if you're going to punish him with whatever, you don't want that parent going to the uh, to the school board. Yeah. The goal of the school board was you don't want to hear parents griping about right so and so, and the principal didn't really didn't reduce the suspension enough or take away the suspension, uh, so that they made that parent happy. Yeah. There's the goal. And and here's the the reality is I'm not afraid of an angry parent if the school acted appropriately in disciplining a child. I'll take that hit. Um, it's like there's a line from a movie that he says, um, that it's, this is this is going to happen to you. He's like, nah, I'll probably, Brad Pitt's the character. He's like, I'll probably get chewed out, but I've been chewed out before. And mm -hmm. I've been yelled at, I've been cursed at, I've been chewed out before. I'm, I, and that's where having courage to do the right thing, even if it's tough, is, is important and necessary. And so, yeah, the discipline piece, back to Ralph's question, which ties in, and I think to your question, too, um, We've got to support and stand with our teachers in making sure that they're disciplined. Parents should and need to be involved, and ultimately parents should be doing the disciplining, and that's in an ideal world. But we have to have safe um, classrooms where kids behave appropriately, and that's part of education, is learning how to behave with others, back to your social um, piece. They've got to interact with other kids appropriately. So, um, I mean, the, the, we have a discipline plan. It's just implementing it and then having the courage to face parents and say, hey, are you doing what you should to keep your kid behaving the right way? And if you're not, then that's a, that's the school has a right to discipline the child to, to, um, to make sure that the rest of the 98% of the students who are doing the right thing can learn. And this question ties right into that. What about educating the parents, and I'll expand a little yeah. bit on that. What about bringing the parents in and saying, we are partners mm -hmm. in the education of your child. Here is what we can do for your child, and here is what we need you to do mm -hmm. as part of that yeah. partnership. Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, you, you answered the question, or basically, I, I just refer to Mike's uh, response. But, uh, <laughs> The, um, it is a partnership, and I think that's where the good school administrators, and a lot do do this. We have this teacher, or the principal of the year from U Matilla High School. Um, so we have a lot of great administrators in Lake County who are doing awesome work, and they know that, and they are working with the parents. Um, what's two answers? One, with school choice, we have opportunity because if a parent wants their child to go to a particular school and they're not zoned for that school, then the school has some flexibility, some leverage in that because if, if you're zoned for a school, you basically by law the kid has to, to go to school there. So you, mm -hmm. you, the parent, you have not much leverage over the parent. I do think you can work with them and try to educate them, have orientation for them, that type of thing. But with school choice now and the opportunities for students to go to schools that they're not zoned for, they can also be removed from those schools. And what I'm in favor of is in any school that is a, a choice school where the parents, and it could be a public school, it could be a charter school, it doesn't necessarily, you, there's, there's district-run schools that are self-selected by parents. I, I think there should be a parent involvement requirement for their child to go there. If you want your child to go to the best school, then there should be a requirement to be involved. It, we, I don't think legally are allowed to require that at zone schools, but we can certainly do the orientations. Um, and then uh, another key component is mentors because sadly Ralph talked about his son and him disciplining him. There's so few fathers in the, the house anymore mm -hmm. and a lot of families, it's grandparents raising the kids, it's the, we have, uh, um, that's a whole s separate discussion, but I think having strong mentors, um, I was in court the other day and there was a gentleman who was wanting to bail out for something he had done and the judge ultimately allowed him to get out on bail, because, and the reason was he had a mentor who said, I'm going to be daily taking accountability for this guy, making sure he's doing the right thing, getting him on track. I was in some trouble when I was growing up, and I learned from that, and I want him to learn from this, and we're going to work with him. But that wasn't his father, but it was a mentor, and we, if we can continue, and I know we have mentoring programs in our schools, we continue to encourage that and expand that where... Um, if there isn't a parent in the home or dad's in jail or mom's in jail or what, whatever the situation is, we have people. And that's where I think the faith-based community can play a huge role in that too, um, in coming alongside and, and partnering with schools in, in the mentorship piece. And then um, now the chaplaincy program uh, is another exciting um, opportunity that schools have. To, the, the state passed a law that basically if parents agree to it, a child can... Um, a, a, 
a local pastor can come on school and work with that child to meet their spiritual needs. Um, and so I think we have some neat opportunities there too. Okay. I know of a teacher using drugs. Take the drug is Adderall. Teachers get one drug test when hired, then never again. Even in Lake County School is told that a teacher is on drugs. They say they can't do a surprise drug test. Mm. Can you fix that? Is so it it's probably in the union contract. Um, that's probably why the, the can't can't do a drug test is there. Um, and the, if they are if they have like if a prescription for the Adderall, then that wouldn't necessarily wouldn't be an issue. But if they're taking Adderall illegally, then obviously that would be a concern. But um, yeah, I mean, I can look into that. Actually, I'm, I, I'm not automatically familiar with how often we drug test. I know I'm drug tested in the military almost once a month. Um, and so I think we, we need drug-free workplace for our, our uh, students and teachers. And so certainly um, would be in favor of, of increasing that if I think that, that um, so I, it's probably union language that would need to change. And so we could say, hey, we'll give you an increase in raise, but we're also going to maybe do drug tests more often. But I'm not sure what the exact cost of that would be. Um, I think r random drug tests should be allowed, but then you could get into a problem of um, how did they determine the probable cause of who they drug tested. Um, so I, I need to look into that and, and before I give a firm on that, but I certainly. The underlying thing is we need drug-free classrooms as mm -hmm. parents and teachers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to combine two questions here. Nice. Some school districts are woke. Lake County does not appear to be woke, except for a few exceptions. What will you do to prevent DEI, CRT, and woke concepts from infiltrating Lake County schools, in particular, the Biden administration's expansion of Title IX? Okay, so one thing that immediately the school board should do, and if I were on there, I would bring it up and lead the effort on it, um, is a resolution opposing um, the unconstitutional fiat from Biden um, on the Title IX, which is basically having to do with uh, boys playing in, in girls' sports. And, and it, it shouldn't have to be said, but I wholeheartedly believe we need to protect women's sports um, in, at the high school level, girls' sports, from men who might, I, I won't go into all the specifics of what, what has led them to that, but they shouldn't be playing in, in girls' sports, that's that's the bottom line. But we could, could and should do a resolution opposing that and supporting the governor. Other districts have done this, Man, uh, Sarasota actually just did this, um, and so that that's a big thing we could do. Uh, um, as far as the just generally the wokeism, um, one of the things we can do, and I want to do immediately, is if you look at our mission statement, it talks about progressive um, education and, and diversity on our school district. And diversity isn't bad in and of itself, but it's not a goal in and of itself. Becoming American citizens is the goal. And wherever your background is, whatever your ethnicity, your race, that doesn't matter. You're an American. Um, my sister, I was born in Malaysia. My sister is Indian, um, uh, Indian ethnicity. And she's an American. We're both Americans, and we learned American values and what, what it means to be an American citizen. Um, and I think the goal is what Martin Luther King Jr. said, that we should judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. And that's the dream that I, I hold and, and, and want us to have. But the obsessive fixation on diversity and race and all that mm -hmm. isn't a focus on that to help people. It's a focus on that to divide. Um, and the reality is if we want to help minority communities teach them phonics and learn how to read across the board, teach them knowledge in the classroom, because unfortunately if you're in a home that isn't reinforcing some of the things you're learning and you're not learning it in school, you're not learning it at all. And so um, schools are a, create a place where they can be transformative for a child in poverty. And that's why I'm so passionate about it is because I don't believe massive government programs, welfare programs, actually transform lives, but education can. And so that's why I'm passionate about it. So as far as keeping wokeism out, a couple immediate steps, pass a resolution on Title IX, change our mission statement to say something to the effect of, and magical language doesn't have to be in there, but I want citizenship in there. Something to the effect of empowering citizens of intellect and character. I think character is a key component to that for lives of excellence. 
So if you um, get a graduate and you never go on to any other school and you uh, run a plumbing, plumbing business, you're a citizen of excellence that learned character and how to think and how to be a citizen. And you're running a successful plumbing business. If you go on and get a PhD, you're living a life of excellence based on being empowered to be a citizen. And that citizenship piece is something we've really lost. And yeah. uh, so, yeah. Very so, good. Okay. I like that a lot. The next one is Lake County Schools has 80% plus women teachers, which reduces male influence for boys. Why hasn't anyone sued Lake County Schools for not being equitable in 50% male teachers? So, um, I don't think from a legal standpoint there's there's a requirement that there has to be 50-50. There has to be, a, there's a requirement to treat equally in terms of when a selection for a position is made. The reality is that um, a lot of times, and, and Ken knows this in education, a lot of times um, women are the only ones who are applying for a position. And so um, that's, especially in elementary. Um, now when you get into high school and football coaches and that, you have more, um, and administrators, you have more men sometimes. But a lot of times at the, at the elementary level, it's it, more women are applying for the positions. Um, they're prettier but, too, they're also prettier. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I agree. So. Um, <laughs> And so, prettier than Kim. <laughs> so, what what can we do about that? I think just go out there and, and talk to and encourage men, um, good high quality teachers to apply across the spectrum, men and women. Um, so. okay. Get equity for men. I went, you mentioned coaches. Uh, I was a coach, uh, <laughs> and uh, however, they have too much influence over the whole school uh, when it comes to kids learning in the classroom. Yeah, pulling kids out of class, them being out of class. True. Uh, the, the, the pep rallies that go, I, I mean, need pep rallies, but mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it just becomes uh, school that. run by coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and oftentimes too, there are outstanding teachers who are also coaches, but oftentimes there are coaches who, oh, by the way, teach. And yeah. so I think it's important to have high quality teachers. And um, I'm okay with even hiring in some cases a, a coach just to coach if we can get away with it and there's the funds, internal funds, separate from the school board funds. Because a lot of programs, especially these high schools, they raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in internal funds that are a part of the athletic and program. So if we can give stipends out of that for coaches and then hire a full-time teacher, it, now it depends. It, you know, Every situation is different. But we got to make sure those coaches aren't just the football coach, but they're actually high-quality instructors too in whatever subject they're teaching. Yeah, there's too much emphasis on the sports aspect yeah. and not enough on the academics. And that's how we end up with an O.J. Simpson. Intramurals should be, I've sure. always said, is something should be pushed so you can get hundreds of kids in a school involved in football. Of course, it'd be flag football as yeah. opposed to a select group. I agree. Because those hundreds of kids are going to benefit from that their entire life, about you know being involved in athletics. So it's, it's eight teams in a high school, uh, 9 through 12, who are picked up and play against each other once in a while, whatever. But uh, that should be pushed in, in, all, in all sports. And PE, it's interesting. PE just has become kind of walk a... Walk the track. Huh? Walk the yeah, track. Yeah, walk around the track. And so mm -hmm. I think we can do more with PE, too. Oh, yeah. um, but, and I also think, it, as silly as it might sound to some, we can incorporate citizenship into PE. So if you're, you do um, the... 1776 workout or the July 4th workout. Obviously, in summertime schools aren't in unless it's summer school. But that's just an example. But incorporating citizenship and important dates into other curriculum and not just keeping it for history over here. Okay, what are the Lake County School District Florida legislative priorities? Which ones do you support, and how will you do that? And what new priorities will you initiate? So typically, um, the, the, I don't have the priorities memorized right off the top of my head, but typically it's, it's local um, account, uh, autonomy in terms of decision making, um, more funding for schools. I know for me, my legislative priorities would be fully fund and put more in the Civic Seal of Excellence training program because my one of my goals on the board would be that every teacher who wants to, I don't think we have the ability to force them to, but every teacher that wants to in Lake County schools that is in teaching social studies goes through that, the governor's civic seal of excellence where they learn about our foundations, they learn the Constitution, and because and, the reality is um, there are some brilliant social studies teachers who know all that, but to become a certified social studies teacher, you have to have a bachelor's degree and then 
you can go take a test, and if you pass 150 question social studies test, you are a certified social studies teacher. And to do that, you have to know some knowledge about history, but you might not have had a good government foundations and documents in the history of our country foundations. So you might not know that. And so that's a way of quality control, making sure that our teachers know that. So that would be a huge priority. Um, another priority would be um, the, um, you know, uh, allowing us on the, on the curriculum front, making sure that we're in alignment with what's happening. And uh, like I said, Hillsdale and others have come in. So I think a lot of the social studies um, stuff is, help, is helping. But then um, the, on the union contracts and how that process works, I think uh, allowing us flexibility in HR at the local level um, is, is helpful because like the drug test, for instance, that, that's the challenge right now with, with public education is it's so controlled by this all-powerful union contract, mm -hmm. which there's some values to having a union. Um, I think historically their unions were a good thing, but I don't, I'm not in favor of public unions that essentially get taxpayer money and then fund, it's this perpetual system. And so um, I think that um, you know flexibility in terms of, of um, HR is important and, and a variety of things. I, um, but I think the biggest thing, too, is going to Tallahassee and working with our state legislators. Mm -hmm. And I know Bill Mathias has done that a lot. Um, I don't know how many others have. Um, I can't speak to it one way or the other. But I think that's important because when you're in there where the at the table as the budget's being made, mm -hmm. that's, that's money that we can implement into our schools and yeah. making sure that we get our fair share is a key component of yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This kicks back to a little bit about what you were saying about... Uh, military standards and rewards. Lake County schools have no performance metrics for departments. <laughs> Thus, you can't evaluate efficiency and effectiveness. What would you do to implement performance metrics for operations? It's a great question. So we have a strategic vision as the, the district. You can go to the website and look at it. And, and I think there's some good stuff. But what we need to do is have a workshop where we drill down into that and look at each department and how they're going to meet that and um, and I think that's they can have a part in bringing so that it's a collaborative process it's not just forcing it on them but they I would I would say that what we would do is we would direct the superintendent um, in a board meeting we would have a public workshop on it maybe or direct the superintendent to have each department come back and present to us what they think are reasonable um, feasible goals, but very specific. That's the key. You know, with goals, if you say, I want to be a better person, what does that mean, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you say, I'm going to read one book a week or whatever it is, that's a very specific goal and, and I think achievable. Measurable and measurable, time, exactly. time deadline. Smart goals or whatever technique you want to use, but I think it's important to have very specific measurable performance. So I, I think you have them bring those ideas back and then the board could tweak them in a workshop and say, that's good, let's add this, let's change this, let's add this. And so for me, I know on the American history and citizenship, some people, obviously that's a key part of my theme. My brother jokingly called me the other day and goes, do you care about American history and citizenship? And I'm like, yeah, oh, I, know. I know you're giving me a hard time and teasing me, but that it's command influence or command emphasis and sometimes you have to have that. So for me, there's specific performance goals as, a, as a, if I have the honor of serving. I want the Civic Seal of Excellence increase our, I want to see how many teachers have it in, in Lake, and then how many um, and make a goal of over a certain period of time, how many can do it. We're currently below the state average in um, our test scores on American history. Um, I want us to be number one in the state. That's the goal. So it's very clear. You, there's a, on the budget, 75% of our total budget goes into the classroom. The state requires us to have public to, uh, publicly available, and it ranks in the state which districts are doing the best on putting funds inside the classroom, resources supporting the classroom or in the classroom. There are some districts that are at 85, 90%. Um, and some of those are a little bit of outliers because one of them is a state-run uh, district, but I want us to get to at least 80% um, percent, um, in possibly higher if we can, but at least 80% of our resources going in the classroom. That means in operations and other areas, getting um, thinning out uh, the fat so that we can put, put that where it matters most in the classroom. Because 
So those are three for me, but I think every single department needs that, and that just looks like directing the superintendent to bring that back to us, doing a workshop, adjusting that, and then coming out. She gets evaluated. She, they, were, they just did a post, and the school board evaluated her and gave her a 98.7 on her, her review of what she's doing and how she's doing. And I think she is doing a great job. I think she's a, a wonderful educator and leader. But I think um, we need that to trickle down into the, the other administrative staff. Another thing on administrators, I think we should have either a policy or a strong recommendation at the very least that if you are a district administrator, you are in a school at least once a week. You know ivory tower hanging out at the district office and just staying there. And I think most of them do. I hope most of them do. But if they aren't, they need to return. Because what happens is you have people over here making decisions for people here and it's When's the last time they were even in a classroom? Yeah. We've got to have that circulation. And so at least once a week, get out and go to a school um, and and interact with the people who your decisions are affecting. And that's one of the things my I'm, my goal is to go to every school um, in the first year I'm in office and, and see every school. Um, and so, because you can't lead if you don't know who you're leading and what you're leading. So. That's right. You'll be put in the top teacher's classroom to observe her. I'll just let you know what happens. Well, and I'll why, ask why him if I can have some flexibility to do, I think it'd be awesome to do an <laughs> undercover boss, because I'm, I'm yeah. And yeah. I'll, a lot of teachers might not even know who their superintendent is. And That's so, right. But I would love to be like on oh, the lunch the line, union helping, uh -huh. um, helping to serve lunch with the, the lunch um, crew and r ride on a bus as a, maybe a, I could pass as a student, probably not, but um, <laughs> hide in the back, you know, and just hang, do um, see, because then that's when you really see and learn when there's not a team of district administrators following you around that's making sure true. the school board members mm -hmm. hearing what you want, yeah. you can truly get in and hear and get that feedback. And it's not a punitive thing. It's not a gotcha thing. It's a getting that feedback so we can make decisions that help and support. I'm, I, I believe in a team effort. I want, I'm want. i not running because I want to be the only person on the school board. I'm running because I want to work with the team. And um, and that's why even though Bill, Bill Mathias opposed you know, the, uh, endorsing me for the Republican Party last night, or on Tuesday, um, I compliment him on the work he's doing on the budget because I think he is great on the budget and uh, I will work closely with him on, on making sure that we continue to do what's best for the school district related to the budget and other things. So. And that leads right into the next question. Have you reviewed the Lake County budget and where can it be reduced? I have um, reviewed it and I think it's not as much reducing, there are some things that can be reduced, it's reprioritizing. And so one of the things that I would like to look at and explore is the possibility the county, the county commission, does fleet maintenance through Enterprise. Um, and mm -hmm. so Enterprise, yeah. they have saved millions of dollars doing that. So I would like us to explore the idea of seeing if we could get, um, like in terms of an enterprise that type of thing, if there's an economy of scale that could be um, found in um, doing our bus maintenance because transportation is key to getting kids to schools, but the main focus is the kid in the classroom learning. And if we can save some money in that process of operations and shift it over, then I think that would be um, one way we could do that. I would like to bring together a, commit, uh, a think tank of citizens and business people, maybe 15, who come up with a, recommend, a list of 10 recommendations for how to save money um, and have them really drill into it. And the reason for that is twofold. One, um, to see an outsider's perspective on some things that could, could be um, found. And then it's also, if I come and bring an idea to the board, then I, for better or for worse, am the one who's leading that charge, right? Where it's a, if it's a, a citizen think tank and there's business people who are bringing those recommendations, then as a board we can together evaluate that and figure out ways to save money and put that more into the classroom, to the 80% of our budget into the classroom. So that's the process I'm going to take to evaluating um, ways we can save money. And I think it has to be a collaborative process because if you don't do that, if I just get on there and say, we need to cut this, this, and this immediately, yeah. Yeah. then do I have a second chirping? Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I'm a hero for proposing yeah. it, but nothing happened, right? So I, I like actually getting things done, not just yeah. proposing an idea that sounds crazy and it never happens. I mean, sometimes you have to stand and take a stand, and I'm okay to stand alone if necessary. But I would like to get things done and have yeah. three votes. My husband stuff. was a transportation manager, so he knows that. So. Then maybe we can talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was okay. good at that. Yeah. 
and yeah, ways to make sure that, and that's key. That's, but I've heard recently, like, think, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard recently that, like, we have some new buses, but we're waiting on the radios to get on them, and so they're sitting in the barn, and we're not, <laughs> oh we're utilizing my. old buses, and I don't know if that's true, but just efficiency is important, and yeah. uh, and, yes. and a key component to that, and I think we can always do better in those areas. Oh, yeah. Okay, Gavin, uh, the ladies need to put this perfect headquarters back in awesome. order. Yeah. So, uh, Last a couple final. Of final questions. And there's always, or occasionally, there is a get the moderator question. Oh. <laughs> Carpetbagger is a difficult title to have. How will you <laughs> counter it besides 15 years of visiting Lake County? Great question. So carpetbagger, uh, is anyone familiar with the history of that? It was a term for people from the north who moved to the south after the Civil War. Um, I certainly was not involved in the Civil War, so I don't know that that would per se apply. It is true that I grew up and lived in Lake County and served as a county commissioner there for two terms. Leslie uh, Campion asked this in the REC meeting. I was very honest and upfront about it. Um, I think that we should be happy that people want to move to Lake County and yep. make it home. Yep. Um, and people who are passionate and excited about it um, and you know I'm going to be an attorney and hopefully make make some money doing that I don't need a position I don't need a title but I am passionate about education if I were a multimillionaire I'm not but if I were my goal would be to have a classical academy where we teach students Western civilization and literature and great books and they come out with um, stimulated and knowledgeable on, on the foundations of our country and our Western civilization roots and go into the world um, prepared as citizens of intellect and character. That's what I would do if I could do anything. And so this is my way of doing that, um, is serving. I want to, to be an attorney in practice and also serve on the school board and make a difference. And um, I love Lake County. Um, I don't think that there's a magic number of years, like there, there are people who have been in Lake County for 50 years and are yep. probably terrible for our county, yep. right? That's right. Um, there are people who have, have moved here recently who can add and contribute. I think what's important about living a long time in a community is understanding and knowing it. And if you look at my Facebook and you look at the people who have endorsed me and the involvement in the community, I think you'll see that I understand, not perfectly, but I understand what's important to our community. I am out there working it, meeting people, interacting, talking, um, and that's where a guy who's lived here for a very long time, the mayor of Tiberias, has endorsed me and is supporting my campaign. Um, the mayor, former mayor of Leesburg is supporting my campaign. Josh Blake um, has endorsed me because they understand I do know our community and will fight for it. And that's what's important to them ultimately, the, the vision the person has and understanding the community. And I understand why that's, that's important because um, you don't want somebody who um, just parachutes in and has no idea about our community. Um, but I have, um, you know, Jerome and Maggie's, um, Maggie Zadick and Mount Dora, he's publicly supporting me, his wife's an administrator. Um, Will he give us free wine if we vote for you then? I wish he doesn't give me free wine, but he might give you a discount. So, um, but you know, so I, I have, um, in, in fact, um, you know, last Memorial Day, I, I'll leave the who the administrators were, but last Memorial Day, I was out swimming on the um, sandbar in Mount Dora with a group of Lake County administrators and, and folks. So, I think that it's understanding our community and being willing to listen and that type of thing. I'll remind you, Donald Trump moved from New York to uh -huh. Florida. And That's I love right. Donald Trump and I'm glad he's a part of Florida. So I don't see him as a carpetbagger. I yeah. see him as a great president who's gonna be a, another president and lives in Florida and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, so. we could all be carpetbaggers. Final Thank question. Yes. Final I question. thought that was fine. Win or lose, mm -hmm. will you be involved in the Lake County School District? Absolutely. I hope you say yes yeah. based on your answer. No. Yeah, and, um, huh? Was, there, was that my question? Yeah. Lake County Republican Party. Party. Oh, okay. Yeah. Lake County Republican Party. Yeah. Ah. And the Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and I actually, before I announced and before I had any intention of running, I came to the Lincoln Reagan um, dinner and um, started getting more involved. Um, law school's tough, so for a while I'm at the on the back stretch where I, I one semester left, so the end is in sight. But um, I was, the first year, they tell you, is the toughest, and I was really focused on making sure that was um, went well, so I wasn't really involved in anything. Um, and 
but now that I have the ability to uh, try to get uh, much more involved. And that was long before I had a desire to run. Um, and the reason I jumped in kind of late is because I wasn't planning on running. I, I didn't need a title, wanted, I just saw that there was a need and thought that we could do better and um, decided to throw my hat in the ring. That was awesome. Yeah. That was awesome. Thanks for all the questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.